good morning to all the delegates attending this conference from india and europe and good evening to our esteemed speakers and delegates from usa and good afternoon to uh, all the delegates from uh, australia new zealand and japan and other places a uh, very warm welcome to our second plenary session uh, this plenary session contains two keynote lectures one will be given by professor scott from uclg the and the other one is by professor rollins fulton college uh, from fulton college of uh, engineering usca this session will be chaired by professor Sam, um, professor nk samadhiya uh he is a well uh, well known personality in india as well as outside he is uh, currently our uh, indian geotechnical president uh i just uh, kept a very brief short bio which i will be reading out uh, professor samadhiya is a pro, uh, professor at department of civil engineering iit roorkee he is currently working in the areas of ground improvement rock engineering underground excavations and foundations he is the president of indian geotechnical society he is also the chairman of cd 48 of bas india he has been an active member of tc207 of issmge professor samadhiya has published more than 200 papers in journals and conferences with this brief introduction i welcome professor samadhiya to our plenary session welcome sir thank you thank you thank you professor jakka yeah uh, this session will be co-chaired by uh, dr uh, darren dr darren shia is an associate professor at the department of civil and environmental engineering national university of singapore he obtained his phd and uh, bachelor's of engineering from cambridge university and nanyang technical university respectively he secured first class with a gold medal in his um, bachelor of engineering his research interests are soil liquefaction chem chemical ground stabilization mesh machine lining and aerial mapping techniques uh, professor darren welcome thank you welcome Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, now uh, there is a second plenary lecture. Uh, it will be delivered by uh, Professor uh, Kyle Rollins. Uh, the topic of the lecture is liquefaction induced pile down drag from full scale testing. So before uh, he starts his lecture. uh i would like to introduce uh, uh, professor rollins uh professor rollins received his bs degree from uh, brigham young university and his phd from university of california at berkeley after working as a geotechnical consultant he joined the civil engineering faculty at byu in 1987 following after his father who was previously a geotechnical uh, professor so in the same department his research has involved geotechnical earthquake engineering deep foundation behavior bridge abutment behavior collapsible soils and soil improvement techniques asc has re recognized his work with the uber research award the wellington prize and the wallis hebert becker award in 2009 he was the cross canada geotechnical lecturer for the canadian geotechnical society and he received uh george uh, osterberg award from from the deep foundation institute in 2014 so with this brief uh, introduction i request uh, professor uh, rollins to uh, deliver his keynote lecture thank you okay thank you very much i'm getting a message that i can't share my screen until the other participant is stopped yeah mr uh, rohit can you please hello okay All right. Uh, good morning. I'm. Uh, this is a photograph of my campus in uh, the Rocky Mountains in 
in the United States, but I'm actually in Italy this morning uh, preparing for another uh, large scale glass liquefaction test. Um, Brigham Young University is one of the two largest private universities in the United States. Uh, this is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are right up against the mountain front here, which was formed by normal faulting. About 80% of our population lives within 20 kilometers of the earthquake fault. So seismic issues are a, are a matter of life and death, uh, a very important issue for uh, our, our area. Uh, today I'm going to talk about one aspect of that, and that's uh, down drag and drag load behavior of piles from uh, large-scale blast-induced uh, liquefaction tests. I'm uh, grateful to be invited to make this presentation. Uh, I'd hope to be uh, returned to India and do this, but uh, we'll have to wait for a little better times, and this is the next best uh, solution. Uh, this uh, research has been sponsored by a number of organizations, including the National Science Foundation in the United States, uh, different state departments of transportation and uh, private consulting companies. We're grateful for all their support. If we uh, have a soft soil profile, uh, many times we support structural loads by using board piles or driven piles and this axial force from the structural uh, system, P, can be resisted by the side friction, Q sub S, along the length of the pile, and then end bearing, which we'll call Q sub B. If we look at the load in the pile as a result of that um, applied load, we'll start out at the surface with that applied load P, and then as we go deeper into the ground, the load will be transferred to the soil by side friction, and then we'll have some end bearing at the base, Q sub B. So I'll be showing the load in the pile in a number of diagrams, so I was wanting to make sure you understood this. So we can, any any time we develop load, we have some settlement that occurs, and at the toe of the pile, we're going to plot the end bearing resistance, or the toe resistance, QB, as a function of settlement. So to develop that resistance, we'll have, say, this amount of settlement. Now, if we have a condition where there is some earthquake shaking, uh, we may have a situation where this loose or medium sand, medium dense sand, could liquefy and lose a lot of its strength. At that point, the, the side friction in the liquefied zone might be very low, and many people assume that it's essentially zero. That causes uh, the load to be transferred further down into the pile uh, and have more end bearing resistance develop. Now, as the soil reconsolidates and dissipates pore water pressure, you have the soil moving downward relative to the pile, and you actually develop negative friction, or this is sometimes referred to as drag load. Uh, so we have to account for this as well. Now, it, below that um, zone where we have down drag, many people still assume that, that the side friction is zero in the liquefied zone which leads to additional settlement from the higher end bearing resistance at the bottom of the pile. But uh, in reality, the only way the soil can settle and develop negative friction is if the excess pore pressures dissipate. And when the pore pressures dissipate, this can lead to a down drag even in the liquefied zone. Now, if that's the case, if we have down drag in the liquefied zone, then we'll experience even more settlement that might not be accounted for if we uh, assume that the side friction in the liquefied soil is zero. Now, you can see that uh, the neutral plane is the point where we have the maximum load in the pile, which would be important for structural design. Above the neutral plane, we have negative friction. Below it, we have positive friction. And we can also look at this in terms of settlement. Uh, we, here I'm plotting the settlement of the soil due to liquefaction in the liquefied zone. And then I'm going to also plot the settlement of the pile 
And the neutral plane would be the location where the settlement of the pile is equal to the settlement of the soil. Now, does this uh, ever cause problems? Well, yes, it has caused problems in, in past earthquakes. Uh, this is a one case uh, history was from the Resurrection River in Alaska during the, this magnitude 9.2 Alaska earthquake in 1964, where a down drag in gravelly soils that liquefied actually pulled the piles out of the pile cap. Another case history is the Juan Pablo Secundo Bridge in Concepcion, Chile, where uh, investigations showed that down drag uh, facilitated settlement of this pier here that uh, was uh, on the order of 50 to or half a meter uh, of settlement. Uh, this is a slide from the uh, gear team that I participated with in Chile. So some of our research in interests are to measure the development of, of negative skin friction during liquefaction and reconsolidation, to determine the skin friction in the liquefied sand, to determine the skin friction in the non-liquefied soil above and below it, and to see if this neutral plane concept that I've described really uh, does, uh, can account for the, the pile settlement and the soil behavior. So I'm going to ex describe several case histories where we've performed testing of this to investigate these components. And then if uh, time permits, uh, sketch out an outline of how this could be evaluated. Our philosophy is that one good test is worth a thousand expert opinions. Uh, this is said by Werner von Braun, the designer of the Saturn V moon rocket. And this doesn't mean that we're opposed to being experts. We all wanna be experts. That's why we come to seminars like this. We think it's important uh, to know the latest developments. But what it does mean is that we need to know how the earth really works. And once we've got ground truth information, you might say, then you can adjust your numerical models like uh, Professor Brandenburg just discussed so that they actually do match what uh, we see in reality. But not all tests are of equal value. Uh, Einstein once said, a theory is something nobody believes except the person who proposed it. And he had a lot of experience with theories. And an experiment or a test is something that everybody believes except the person who performed it. And this is, maybe you've had some tests like this yourself where you're not quite certain that everything was done correctly and the result is uh, exactly as it should be. So we have to look skeptically at, at what's done and, and see if it makes sense. So how could we investigate this down drag problem? Well, we could use a large scale testing in the laboratory. We could use small centrifuge models, which can be used successfully. We can use this large laminar shear box that I used at the University at Buffalo. But in this case, we have to construct the sand and it may be different than what's going on in uh, reality in a natural soil deposit. If we move out to large scale field testing, we could go investigate sites in highly seismic areas. And maybe we get lucky and have a site that was instrumented where we could have, the, have everything measured during an earthquake. This might take 10 or 20 years to get a result. We could also use vibrosize trucks like Professor Stokey uses, but this uh, has its limits as well and we can only test a very small volume close to the surface. So our approach has been to use controlled blasting uh, to investigate this problem. I should point out that no method is perfect. We learn a lot from each method. They all contribute to helping us understand the whole the behavior. So each piece provides a, a one piece of the puzzle uh, to help us understand the situation. First time we used this was the idea was, was at Treasure Island in San Francisco where we detonate small explosive charges in the ground. And then that uh, induces excess pore pressures so that the soil liquefies. And then we can test features inside, like in this case, piles loaded laterally in, in liquefied soil. The advantages here are that we can test at full scale we have the native soil in situ with the real microstructure and aging that's involved. We can liquefy very large volumes at one time to investigate system performance. 
which I'll describe uh, in New Zealand here in a little while. And we can also liquefy soils to depths of 10 to 20 meters. Uh, we've also found that we can produce settlement that's very similar to earthquake-induced values, as I'll show later on. But there are limitations, of course, as with any method. The mechanism of pore pressure generation is not identical to an earthquake, and we need to do more research to help understand this. There's components of compression, but we think largely the pore pressures are developed by shear strains. We must avoid large vibrations and disturbance to adjacent uh, structures and people. And this uh, full-scale testing is more expensive than small-scale tests. Uh, nevertheless, we've had an opportunity to, to do these tests at four different sites uh, in Vancouver, British, in Canada. We did tests on driven piles at 32 centimeter diameter. In Christchurch, we did tests on 60 centimeter auger cast piles in Italy. Uh, five years ago, we did tests on micropiles, and in Arkansas with uh, Professor Kaufman, we did tests on 45 centimeter driven piles and 1.2 meter drilled shafts. This, uh, and so I'm going to talk about these sites. The, the Vancouver site, you, you can see Vancouver in the distance in this photograph. Uh, it, you can see the river, the road leading into Vancouver. Um, if you're a structural engineer, you probably think that you ought to have a, a, a bridge structure here, but this is, um, path is covered by a, a tunnel at, at the present time. Uh, and we received uh, authorization to use the Canada, Canada liquefaction experiment site for these down drag tests. This site consists of uh, a soil profile with uh, primarily of sand with some non-liquefiable soil that's uh, silty at the top. Uh, the relative density is about 40% and it's very uniform with depth. And our pile extends from the ground surface to a depth of about 21 meters. The SPT N160 value is about 10 in the target zone for liquefaction, which is from maybe five to 13 meters. And it's 17 near the tip of the pile. They, they got these values uh, uh, from field testing. Now, uh, our idea was to put a test pile in place with uh, four reaction piles to set off these explosive charges, to measure the excess pore pressures that were developed with pore pressure transducers, and to measure the strain that developed in the pile uh, with those triangular strain gauges. Uh, we applied load that's equal to one half of the ultimate capacity of the pile uh, prior to loading uh, or prior to the blast test. Uh, to monitor the settlement of the soil, we used a Sondex settlement pipe. Uh, so we have a corrugated pipe with um, rings, metallic rings, and the soil or the pipe settles with the ground. And then from this access, point we can see where the where the soil has moved and gives us a nice profile of settlement versus depth. So this is a, a, a indication or a, a video of that. Yeah, yeah go! <laughs> seen that that, um, that pipe settled on its own weight about, uh, about 30 to 40 centimeters uh, just as the soil liquefied. Now you probably heard as soon as the explosives started detonating that um, the reaction piles moved up a little bit and reduced the, the load on the test pile. And that reduction was about 160 kilonewtons and we turned on the pumps to reapply that 160 kilonewtons of force uh, to the test pile. And we'll see the result of that here in a minute. Uh, we monitored the excess pore pressure ratio 
RU and RU value of one indicates liquefaction and in that zone from six meters to about 13 meters, we're getting excess pore pressure ratios between 0.9 and one, indicating that the soil is essentially liquefied in this zone. But down at the tip of the pile, at the toe of the pile, the excess pore pressures are um, less than about 15%. The pore pressure is dissipated from the bottom upwards, which is uh, typical of what we see but it took about 17 minutes for that excess pore pressure to go back down to zero uh, or down to 10% of the um, uh, static value. Uh, this is a, a poor man's uh, video of uh, the settlement of the ground around the test pile as those charges detonate the soil liquefied and then settled. So this is 10 minutes uh, after the blast took place. Uh, this is a, a photograph of the head of the, to the top of the pile before liquefaction. And here's the plot after liquefaction. We had about 27 centimeters of ground settlement, which represents a volumetric strain of about 3%. It's a very uh, unusual experience. When I ran out to watch this, I um, saw that it, it looked like, I'm, I'm so used to the ground being stable that it looked like the pile was moving upward out of the ground, but it was the soil settling. Uh, so within the zone of liquefied soil, we're seeing relatively uh, consistent settlement versus depth, increase in settlement versus depth. Uh, we had a little slippage at one point, but we're uh, thinking that uh, the Sondex tube represents that settlement over the interval and the top layer of soil that was above the water table is essentially going down with the surrounding soil. So our measured settlement of 270 millimeters was about the, at the ground surface was about what the Sondex was recording. How does that compare with what you would expect from an earthquake event? Uh, there's a number of people that propose techniques. Uh, Tokimatsu and Seed uh, suggested for a blow count of 10 that you'd expect volumetric strain of about two and a half percent. Yoshimi and uh, Ishihara suggest for that value you might uh, expect volumetric strain of three and a half percent. And we're, we're, we're measuring a, a volumetric stra strain of about three percent. So it's very right it, within the range of what you would expect for settlements in liquefied soil. All right, um, the blue curve shown here is the load in the pile just before blasting. And I, I told you that soon after blasting, we lost load and we had to reapply that load again. And as we reapplied that load, which was 160 kilonewtons, we reapplied a positive, fric positive friction. Normally we'd expect negative friction to develop and go downward from the ground surface. Uh, but let's focus on the liquefied zone here. So again, blue is the uh, load in the pile uh, versus depth prior to liquefaction. liquefaction. And in that zone, we had about 180 kilonewtons of resistance. Just after blasting, the curve is very almost vertical, so we're having very little resistance, which is what we'd expect in liquefied soil. And, but at the end of settlement, we're seeing uh, negative friction that's equal to about 90 kilonewtons on average, which is about half of the positive skin friction value that we had prior to liquefaction. All right, well, it's, it's hard to build a uh, design method based on one test pile, but that's one data point. So what's going on here? Um, conceptually, let's look at this. The static loading before liquefaction, can, we, can, with the, we can estimate the side friction as being equal to K times the tangent of the interface friction times the vertical effective stress times the area of the shaft. And if we take K times tan delta as beta, we'd have beta times the vertical effective stress times uh, area of the shaft. So we just have static water pressure here. Immediately after liquefaction, 
the excess pore pressure becomes equal to the vertical effective stress and our uh, skin friction goes close to zero. So we could approximate that by saying our beta would be equal to zero relative to the initial vertical effective stress. During reconsolidation, the excess pore pressure is decreasing to zero. And as it does that, and effective stress increases, we start to see negative friction developing. So the soil can grab onto the pile and cause it to move downward. So in our case, that beta for this situation would be about 50% of the beta before liquefaction. Now, one open question is what happens long-term if you were to reload that pile, would you get the same skin friction you had before? And that's one thing we're investigating in our blast test that will take place this Friday here in Italy. Um, from the centrifuge tests, uh, Kanapa and uh, Matabushi did measurements and um, they had a different system, so they didn't have exactly the same load displacement uh, profile as, uh, as we did, but they report that they had uh, negative skin friction values, which were very similar to what uh, we reported in our study in 2006. Uh, then along came the Christchurch, New Zealand earthquake with this iconic photograph of liquefaction and sand ejecta with a damage of 50 to 51,000 um, structures from liquefaction and economic loss of $40 billion uh, where about a third of that, which is uh, attributed to liquefaction induced damage, uh, according to my colleague, uh, Shord Van Balagui. So the, the New Zealanders wanted to see if they could improve a zone of soil, maybe four meters thick to support the soil weight and let the soil underneath that improved zone liquefy so that they could um, minimize differential settlement and have the building perform in an acceptable way at a lower cost than they would otherwise uh, do. And so they uh, asked us to participate in, in creating liquefaction uh, in the underlying soil using blast uh, induced um, techniques. The soil profile at the site we were testing there in Christchurch is shown here. It's a clean um, medium dense sand uh, with the water table at about two meters. Uh, velocity is about a little below 200 meters per second and relative density is about 60%. So we constructed um, three auger cast piles with a diameter of about 60 centimeters. We monitored pore pressure, we monitored settlement uh, from our blasting and we did in-situ tests before and after treatment. So I put three piles, these three piles down, one extended to eight and a half meters, another to 12 meters and a third to 14 meters. And our objective was to set off these explosive charges and liquefy layers of soil so that I would have one test pile where the toe was in liquefied soil and two other test piles with, with piles below the liquefied zone. So we did uh, first the test with no pile, no load on the piles. Here you see these uh, three test piles here, here, and here. <clears throat> and these were uh, investigated along with other ground improvement uh, strategies that could be employed. Subsequently, we loaded the piles up and did a static load tests as best we could uh, using dead weights. So we didn't have the problem we had in Vancouver. So we applied 270 tons of loading on the test piles. So here's the auger cast pile being put in place. I think you use these in India. Uh, we auger down to the depth of interest. We um, use the auger as a casing as the auger is pulled up, we inject grout, and then we vibrate the casing back down into the grout, and that's our um, completed test or completed pile. And to monitor behavior, we have sister bar strain gauges, and we have thermal integrity sensors 
to monitor the diameter of the pile. It was a good thing we did this. They were designed to be 60 centimeters in diameter, but based on this tomographic principle of the thermal integrity profile ometer, we found that our, our piles were actually 70 to 75 uh, centimeters in diameter. Uh, we supported our piles with a, a frame with the weights stacked on top of this frame. And then between each of the piles in the frame, we had a load cell to monitor the load carried by each of the piles. Uh, to uh, save money and uh, allow us to do three tests with limited budget, we uh, moved the test, we moved the weights around to be loaded over the top of each pile so we could uh, kind of do a static load test. Uh, it was a little, Frightening, but we got the job done. Uh, here's uh, for the eight and a half meter pile, we were able to get a complete load deflection curve, but for the other uh, piles, we only got to, to a settlement about 10 millimeters, but we got most of the side friction and some of end bearing. Uh, so this is a, a test again with no piles, uh, with no load in place. And I'm gonna show you, uh, this is our test piles he here. And there's four different ground improvement strategies along with no improvement strategy. Hundreds of, char of kilograms of charges are gonna be detonated here. My wife asked me if they pay me to do this work because it looks like I'm just having a good time. Uh, what was the result of this? You can see that the water pressure has caused we, uh, the sand grains to, uh, that is not sand grains to come to the ground. Straight surface. out of the ground. And so we see these uh, sand volcanoes or sand boils forming uh, throughout the, the site. So here's one particularly, these are the sand, uh, um, this is the sand ejector around our piles. So we knew that we were getting liquefaction. <clears throat> this is a particularly large one uh, here. Um, we also measure the pore pressure. So we have the vertical effective stress shown by this line. The excess pore pressure is shown in red and we've essentially liquefied the soil all the way to 13 meters. We used a little bit too much explosive in this situation, but um, we can still see what uh, happened. Uh, Mike Olson at Oregon State um, helped us with laser scanning. So we know the settlement of the soil relative to the piles and this Pile and the soil is settling more than the test piles in this case. So as a result of that, we have negative skin friction, which is developing. The colored lines are the measured uh, load in the pile. And the dashed lines are the uh, percentage of the static load resistance that gives us the best agreement with what was measured. So in each case, we have a neutral plane. The neutral plane becomes deeper as we move, as the pile is uh, deep, is, extends to greater depth. So above the neutral plane, we have negative friction. Below the neutral plane, we have positive friction in each of these cases. And uh, if we compare with the static resistance in the liquefied layers, we have about, well, let's see, 43 to 55% of the static resistance that we had before liquefaction. So this is in uh, rough agreement with what we had at our test site in Canada. Uh, the neutral plane location is consistent with what we'd expect based on the settlement of the piles, which was encouraging. And then we did a, another test where we had the 270 ton loads uh, on the piles in place. And we started to get a little nervous about this because if, um, if this one pile settled excessively, the whole structure might tip over and uh, our, our test would be ruined. So what I did is shift the weights around so that the factor of safety was very low over the 8.5 meter pile and it was uh, deeper or the factor of safety was very low. 
sorry, did I say that wrong? It was high under the shallow piles and it was low under the deeper piles. So this is a video of that. Uh, I was quite nervous. And the line shows you where we are. Today. Afterwards, you can see that there was this characteristic uh, sand volcano indicating that we'd had liquefaction develop. Uh, here again is the vertical effect of stress. In this case, we didn't liquefy the soil quite as much because it had already settled um, in somewhat in the previous test, but we're still getting 80% excess pore pressure down to maybe 12 millimeters. Uh, again, now uh, we measured settlement of the soil and the piles because of this bigger load are settling more than the surrounding soil. So if we look at the soil in the liquefied zone, we're seeing about 42% uh, of the static capacity in that zone and below in the non-liquefied soil, our skin friction is about the same as the skin friction during the static load test. Uh, I'll show you maybe one more and then I need to move on. So we, we have um, uh, the Mirabello Italy test, which is where I am today. This was a, a single micro pile. Uh, we're setting off explosive charges um, at two levels, about um, 1.8 kilograms and 2.5 kilogram uh, charges. We monitor the settlement with the profilometer, the Sondex pipe. We monitor settlement, um, or, or we monitor strain in the pile with strain gauges and monitor the pore pressure with the pore pressure transducers. The micro pile is about 25 centimeters in diameter. There's a steel pipe that acts as the reinforcement. And then there's cement grout around uh, and in between and inside the pipe. This is a photo of the strain gauges uh, put in place. And after the test, we exhumed the micro pile to see if we had the diameter we were expecting and it uh, looked like it was pretty close to what we designed. Uh, we didn't have uh, money for a, st a static load test in this case, but we did the next best thing which was to do drop load tests and use a pile driving analyzer. So we have a 700 kilogram weight drop from 20, 50, and 70 centimeters. And we use cap wrap to determine the capacity. This gives us the side friction and the tow resistance for the test pile. So here's a video of the test in Mirabello. went off a little faster than we wanted to accommodate the driller, the blasters. Uh, but we did uh, again see liquefaction. I'm just going to skip right to the end here. Uh, this orange line or reddish line uh, is the negative friction we'd expect if there was no reduction in capacity based on the cap wrap analysis. But you can uh, from zero to six meters where we have clay in the profile. We see that our uh, measured side friction is about the same as what CAPWAP predicts. But when we go into the liquefied zone here, uh, the side friction uh, decreases. And if you look at that, it's on the order of 40 to 50% uh, lower than this negative, the, the negative friction you would expect if there were no liquefaction here. Uh, we're um, seeing an uh, end bearing resistance of about 187 kilonewtons, um, extrapolating down from our strain gauges. Uh, this is the location of the neutral plane. Uh, 
based on settlement or based on load and it corresponds roughly with the ground settlement uh, with the location where the pile settlement and the ground settlement are the same. The settlement of the ground in this case was about 17 centimeters, but the pile settlement was only about 15 millimeters. So just because you have a very large amount of liquefaction induced settlement doesn't mean that you'll have a lot of pile settlement. It largely depends on the end bearing resistance you have for your, your pile. Um, this uh, is the QZ curve that shows the toe resistance versus deflection from cap wrap uh, for uh, different cases of loading. And for the blast test, uh, in comparison to what we got from the field test, we're getting about um, 195 kilonewtons, which was in very good agreement with our measured toe resistance. In the non-liquefied soil above the pile, above the, in the clay, we're getting a, a side friction of about uh, 82%, um, possibly due to some water moving up along the interface. And in the liquefied zone, we're seeing a, a, about 46% of the friction that we had before. Uh, one last test we did was in Arkansas, where we preloaded uh, driven piles, a 45 centimeter diameter pile and uh, 1.4 to 1.8 meter diameter board piles. And this uh, plot shows that we've liquefied a zone from about nine to uh, 14 meters. Uh, the settlement uh, in the soil was about uh, 95 millimeters and the settlement of the soil was only eight millimeters because of the large end bearing capacity we, we still had. If we look at the neutral plane where the maximum load is the highest and the neutral plane where the settlement is the same as the pile, they're very close to one another. And the end bearing resistance at 600 kilonewtons is about what we would expect from uh, the QZ curve uh, based on um, O'Neill and uh, uh, Reese. So this all is fitting together quite nicely and, and the conclusions we're seeing is that in non-liquefied soil, the negative friction is roughly equal to the positive friction. In liquefied soils, the negative and positive skin friction after liquefaction and reconsolidation was somewhere between 40 and 55% of the skin friction before liquefaction. These results are uh, quite consistent for all the available tests. And now there are 14 test piles which are showing the same result. And, and they suggest that this might be a typical result to expect for design. The depth to the neutral plane increased and settlement decreased as the pile length uh, increased. And the settlement we're seeing is generally consistent with the neutral plane concept. There are some inconsistencies in a few cases, but it's generally consistent. So the way we'd suggest to design, it would be first to determine the settlement versus depth uh, and assume a neutral plane location using whatever is your favorite method for estimating settlement. So this might be your zone of liquefied soil and this would be your estimate of settlement of the soil. All right, uh, then you just decide on a neutral plane um, and you'll have to iterate, you'll have to change the location to get agreement, but just assume some value to begin with. Now we're gonna compute the load distribution in the pile. We'll have negative friction above the neutral plane, positive friction below our assumed neutral plane, and we'll use 50% of the skin friction in the liquefied layers. And we'll use this to find the toe resistance uh, QB. So we would start out at the load that we've applied we'd have negative skin friction increasing down to the, our assumed neutral plane. And we'd have positive skin friction uh, decreasing the load in the pile down to the end of the pile. And this would be our um, toe resistance that we'd need to have for equilibrium on this pile. Now we need to determine the settlement of the toe of the pile. And we can um, do this by uh, taking the settlement of the soil at the neutral plane and subtracting off the elastic compression of the 
of the pile below the neutral plane. And this will give us the settlement uh, expected at the toe of the pile. Lastly, we can use the QZ curve to determine if the mobilized toe resistance is equal to their toe resistance that's required for equilibrium. So we'll use that settlement, go to our uh, QZ curve for that settlement and get this um, required Q sub B value. And we compare those two, are they consistent with one another? Are they the same? If they're different, then we need to revise our neutral plane location and repeat the process until we uh, get convergence so that the neutral plane, uh, so we get the same Q sub B for uh, both cases. And we think this uh, process could be something that could be used with uh, relatively little difficulty in routine design. I appreciate your attention and uh, uh, want to ask maybe if there are questions about um, what we presented here today. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rollins. And uh, it was a, an excellent lecture and especially you have uh, uh, presented the case histories, actual tests, actual tests. So we also say in Hindi that pratyaksh ko pramad ki jarurat nahi hoti means if something is visible uh, before your eyes, then there is no uh, requirement of any proof. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. testing, uh, especially in geotechnical engineering, these field tests are very important and you have shown the importance of these large scale testing by your presentation. So it was uh, an excellent lecture. Thank you so much for that. So now I, now I request uh, Professor Darren to start discussions. Oh, hi, Professor. Um, uh, 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 Professor Rollins, uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the wonderful um, talk. Um, well, I'm a more experimental person, so 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 I can totally uh, enjoy you know what that you have done. The field work um, is really impressive. It's really impressive, uh, and and you know and this must have taken uh, lots of uh, planning, lots of hard work, and not forgetting also you know to to you know to secure the funding you know to do field tests. I think these are all very. Uh, uh, very, very, very tough. Uh, you know, thank you to 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 uh, you know to make it happen as you know as what as what uh, um, that you know uh, um, uh, that our chair said is that uh, that field test is the truth. Is you know, so the results that we have gotten from few you know from field tests is uh, indeed uh, uh, very crucial for us to do you know be be it to understand the failure mechanisms, be whether to do calibrations for our numerical work. I think certainly all of these are huge, huge uh, contributions, uh, you know, that what that you have done. You know, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so far, um, I think we are still waiting for questions to, to come in. Uh, perhaps I'll just ask a question uh, pertaining to the BLAST, uh, the BLAST liquefaction um, experiments that you have done. Um, so, uh, I mean, based on your view, uh, how would blast uh, liquefaction, uh, you know, uh, be able to represent earthquake, uh, and especially when it comes to down drag uh, of the piles, um, how would it differ? Because what I do see from your presentation is that the blast, uh, the blast uh, liquefaction uh, occurs at a deeper depth, and then subsequently the shallower um, explosive is being uh, detonated. Uh, after that. So I'm just wondering, in this case, uh, would the liquefaction progress from the bottom up, whereas in the case of uh, earthquake-induced uh, liquefaction, the, uh, that the liquefaction generally uh, develops from the water table to the greater depths. So uh, would the analysis of our down drag be first? Uh, well, certainly that the concept, that the theories, it will still be the same. But I'm just wondering whether uh, uh, are we going to expect a larger settlement, or you think that you know that uh, they eventually, when the excess pore pressure uh, dissipates, you know, and the settlements, it will still be uh, the same. 
That's, that's a very good question. There are certainly some issues involved and differences between what we do and what an earthquake does in reality, and, and we don't deny that. Um, we wish we could, we are, we're trying to detonate our explosives sequentially now with a second or so in between, so we at least have 16 seconds for pore pressures to develop, uh, so it's more like an, an earthquake event. And, and we blast from one side to the other so we have a wave front going in two different directions to try and better simulate this but we we can't do it completely uh, i'm kind of an impatient person and so this is a good method for me i don't have to wait for an earthquake i can simulate it like this uh, my colleague uh, Armin Studline at oregon state university has done some testing and um, his results seem to indicate that most of the pore pressure that's generated is due to shear strain rather than just compressive strain like many of us have thought for years. Um, uh, even though a compression wave goes through the profile, uh, there's a, a shear strain component that does develop afterwards and, and uh, is responsible for much of the residual excess pore pressure. Um, we also think that the settlement, well, at least in our cases, maybe we've been lucky, but um, if you have enough explosives and not too much, you get a settlement that's quite similar to what you would expect in an earthquake event. And we think the combination of the high excess pore pressure with the amount of settlement that is similar to an earthquake, we, we get a... a Kind of a reasonable rep representation of what might happen. Yeah, thank you so much for for sharing. Um, it, uh, uh, my view is that if I were to to do to do a few tests, I would have done done likewise because I, I you know yeah you know for blast wise uh, you know the best that we can do is just you know have it to be to be done uh, sequentially and and you know and and you know and just wait for the liquefaction. Uh, <laughs> To happen right and, and then after we do some measurements you know, and yeah but certainly i think uh, for the down drag um uh, study i think this is something which is uh, very uh, helpful uh, to the practicing engineers i think uh, to be honest is that i have yet to you know to to you know to see you know such a extensive work being done pertaining to uh, to down drag you know following uh you know yeah following a huge uh, uh, liquefaction event. So uh, yeah, so indeed, just now when you were sharing, uh, you know, it was really, really enjoying uh, you know, to, to, to listen to. Um, there, is, uh, there is a question that just uh, came in. Um, the question is, after the explosion, what is yes, the percentage yes. improvement of N values of soils in the liquefied soil? I suppose the N values is pertaining to the SPT? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we we see some increase in the so we're not trying to improve the ground with the blasting, but there is a ground improvement strategy known as uh, explosive compaction, and they usually use charges that are larger than the explosive charges that we use. So our our objective is not necessarily to to densify the soil in the process, but we do see some increase, and, but it's relatively small, maybe like a 15% increase in the cone tip resistance or flow count. And many times, uh, it's un interesting to me that um, after the liquefaction takes place, these soil particles are forced apart and the structure is kind of disturbed and disrupted so it takes some time for that structure to get back into place and start to age. Uh, so we find that many times it requires uh, two or three months for the soil structure to regain its, its bond and get back to the cone, tip, cone resistance that you had before the blast. So in the testing that we're um, undertaking now, we're going to... Um, we did a test, a static load test before the blast. We're going to do another static load test on a separate pile immediately after the blast. 
And then we're going to do a static load test on a third separate pile in a few months after the blast to see what, uh, what um, increase in resistance that we get, or if we can at least get back to the same pile capacity that we had before the blast. Wow, this is, this is really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, you know, that we certainly uh, uh, look forward to more updates uh, from you uh, in your testing. Uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Jaka has a question. Um, yeah. Oh, please. Uh, Professor Rowling, uh, thank you very much for presenting such a nice uh, comprehensive study. It's really exciting. Uh, I just have one curious question. Like I understood, like uh, um, drown drag is going to increase the load, but uh, thing is, uh, liquefa when liquefaction occurs, soil loses the strength, load increases. Perfect. Then when the soil is settling, drown drag is going to increase the load, but these yeah. two are going to occur one after other. After the liquefaction, once water pressure starts dissipating then drown drag occurs okay but yeah in a uh, real scenario uh, when the structure uh, is applying load on the pile load on the pile during the shaking is going to be more and at that time yes we can we are ignoring and then uh, we are converting everything to the end, end loading but uh, when round drag is uh, applying load, the structural load will not be there. Additional structural load, inertial load will not be there. So are they not kind of compensating? Um, well, in our tests, we've had cases where there, where there is no structural load, just because it's um, difficult to apply that, that load. As you saw in some of those cases, uh, it costs a lot of money to, to provide a dead weight uh, so most of our tests have, have not involved any structural loading, but in, in reality, in most cases, there is an applied load that remains constant during the earthquake shaking. And you're correct that there will be some inertia forces that go up and down and increase the load on the pile, uh, which you know, I'm not denying could have some effect because you're, you're, like in our case, you saw the piles when we reloaded, the skin friction went positive at the top of the pile. So there could be some effects like this. Um, uh, but I think the net, net behavior will be what happens at the end of the earthquake shaking. And, and in that shaking, when the skin friction decreases due to liquefaction, uh, as you saw in that one video, uh, you're going to get some immediate settlement due to the liquefaction and the reduction in and side friction in the liquefied zone. But we think in addition to that, after the core pressures dissipate, you'll get some additional settlement due to down drag um, in the, even the liquefied soil and the pile and the soil above the test pile, or sorry, the soil above the liquefied zone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. It's uh, been a pleasure to. Uh, to uh, Professor Darren, there are yes, two, three yes, there are, yes, there are more questions coming in. Uh, oh. um, yes, the next question. Yeah, uh, this is, the next question is uh, how the blast charges are decided for inducing the liquefaction in soil. I think this is a very uh, uh, good question. Uh, you know, which I'm also very keen to find out. Um, that's a good question. We, we initially uh, used some experimental data from um, Studer and Koch, and they had used much larger charges. In fact, they'd used even nuclear blast <laughs> uh, case histories where they were far away from the uh, nuclear blast, <laughs> of course. Uh, but um, that, that gives you a correlation between um, the excess pore pressure ratio and the scale distance. So the, the uh, weight of the charge divided by um, uh, the distance divided by the uh, weight of the charge to the one third power. Uh, so this gives you a, a correlation. And since that time, um, Professor Ashford and I have done a number of tests and 
combining all that data together, uh, one of his students has uh, provided an improved um, equation that, re that ac accounts for the weight of the charge and the density of the soil, because you can expect that a denser soil will take more energy to liquefy. And third, um, the depth. So as you go deeper in the profile, it takes more energy to liquefy the soil as well. And we've, we found this out <laughs> experimentally at our site in Arkansas, where we were trying to liquefy to a much greater depth. So the, the, there's an equation for predicting that behavior now. Thank you so much uh, for the sharing. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, during the blasting, could you obtain the acceleration data generated? Uh, yes, we could. Um, we have our, our colleagues here from the Italian Institute, National Institute for Geophysics and Volcanoes, and, and they set out a large array of um, ground motion recording devices, and we also measure acceleration um, in the ground itself. So as you would expect, uh, close into the blast, um, uh, we get... Um, we get accelerations that are much larger than you'd have in an earthquake. So, you know, on the orders of uh, maybe 10 G or something like this, but as you move away, uh, that it becomes closer to what you'd see in an earthquake. And our colleagues from the Italian Institute say that when we're uh, about a hundred meters away, that it's not the frequency content and so forth is not much different than an earthquake, but uh, we're, we're not so much concerned about the acceleration as we are with the velocity, and the velocity is, um, uh, seems reasonable. Uh, and again, we're not trying to simulate a, a, an earthquake. We're just trying to induce pore pressures that would be induced by an earthquake. So the, the peak ground accelerations are much higher than you would record in an actual earthquake, but we think the strains are, are compatible. Sorry, I have, a, I have a leading question uh, um, on this. I have came across um, blast tests uh, done by others uh, who, who tried to create soil uh, liquefaction. However, what they have seen was a huge increase in excess pore pressure uh, to liquefaction. However, the dissipation was also very quick. So uh, uh, the ground is actually... Uh, Fine, 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 sandy material, uh, and they are just wondering whether uh, why aren't they able to to see that sustained uh, gradual dissipation of excess pore pressure? What is your 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 take on this? Um, you know, uh, has the blast been done in a wrong manner, or or you feel that what can be improved? Um, well, we we try to. Uh liquefy a, a larger volume. So we've, we've often used a ring that has a radius of about uh, five meters. Uh, in our test to, on Friday, it's going to be, have a radius of seven meters because we're testing a pile group. So um, having a larger volume um, of liquefied soil will cause it to um, dissipate slower. So in New Zealand, we had five uh, different rings and there was a large volume of soil that was liquefied. Uh, if they have blasted and have just a very small diameter, uh, then soil can, uh, pore pressures can dissipate horizontally and also vertically. And this uh, allows them to dissipate much more rapidly. Uh, the other thing that uh, slows the dissipation process is that uh, if you have a clay layer at the top, like in several of the cases we had clay that was, um, well, in this site we're working now is six meters of clay. And so that takes, um, you know, it takes about an hour for the excess pore pressures to get back down to static levels. I see, wow. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much, Professor Brandenburg and uh, Professor uh, uh, Rollins for excellent lectures. And uh, uh, 
let us appreciate the efforts of both the professors by just clapping and thank you so much for uh, giving uh, time to this particular conference so now thank you so much and now over to professor jakka thank you professor uh, first of all we are thankful to both our speakers uh, respected uh, professor uh, Kain Rollins and uh, Professor uh, Bradenberg for uh, sparing their uh, valuable time with uh, all of us, and I also thank uh, our chair, Professor Samadia, and co-chair, Professor Darren, for nicely and lively conducting this session. Thank you very much, sir. All of you. Uh, I request all the participants uh, to move to the parallel halls. Uh, maybe we are, I think, little bit uh, running late. So maybe in few minutes, we'll be starting in parallel halls. Thank you, one and all. See you.